What kind of an evangelical are you? Roll it, fellas. This is Ernest. <laughs> I'm going to die. Give me a hug. You are going to love this. Hello, and welcome to Wretched. My name is Todd Friel. I am your host, the Wretch the song refers to. Uh, there's a wee bit of a debate going on in evangelical Christianity, but lo and behold, this debate, it ain't nothing new. Since the mid-1800s, there has been a concerted effort to broaden the definition of evangelicalism so that more people can sort of fit into the tent. And, and, and anyone, everyone who self-identifies as a Christian wants to be in that tent because no matter how much the word evangelicalism has lost its luster and, and no matter how fuzzy and indistinct the idea has become, that label is still a shorthand way of signifying that I'm someone who truly believes the Bible and takes the gospel seriously. So naturally, false teachers love to be accepted as evangelicals because that minimizes the criticism and the suspicion that typically gets aimed their way. And Charles Spurgeon noticed that same phenomenon. That's why I say it's gone on since the 1800s. He wrote about it in the 19th century, and he pleaded with the true evangelicals of his era not to accept the claims of those who say they are evangelicals, but they really aren't. What exactly is an evangelical and who really qualifies? That is the question. Actually, those are the questions. An evangelical historically is an individual who believes in the new birth, that a man, a woman must be born again, that God must take a dead sinner and bring them to life, granting them repentance and faith. And now this individual follows after his Lord and Master, being guided solely by the rule book of life, the Bible. Boiling it all down, that's about it. That's an evangelical. It is also one who has great concerns for the souls of the lost, a desire to seek and to save with their Savior those who are lost. That is an old school, we'll call it a paleo-evangelical. And yet, for the last 150 years at least, evangelicalism is continually bombarded and assaulted by individuals who want to expand the term so that they can be allowed inside the tent. They don't want to change their theology. They want evangelicals to broaden their definition so that they can qualify for all of the good things that do come from being an evangelical Christian. And this battle has been going on at least for a century and a half. And he warned the Baptist Union that the plan of the enemy was, in his words, quote, to lay the egg of error in the nest of our churches. And he warned that people who called themselves evangelicals but rejected evangelical principles had already begun to infiltrate the Baptist Union. That's why he got kicked out. And these pseudo-evangelicals took the label for themselves, but they refused to define what it meant, just like today. And in 1888, Spurgeon wrote this, quote, It is mere cant, meaning hypocrisy, a pious pretense, to cry, we are evangelical, we are all evangelical, and yet decline to say what evangelical means. Spurgeon says, if men are really evangelical, they delight to spread as glad tidings the truths from which they take that name. And by the start of the 20th century, modernists had gained a foothold in virtually all of the major evangelical denominations by posing as evangelicals, even though they really weren't. Do you know who were the first evangelicals? Well, it's really been all believers for all times, but the Puritans were evangelicals. 
Nope, you didn't hear the term bandied about regularly, but they were the Bible believers who believed in grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, revealed in Scripture alone, for the glory of God alone. And they wanted the world to hear this message. They were primarily concerned about the gospel. Fast forward the mid-19th century, Charles Spurgeon lived in an era of evangelicals, and yet in his time, there was already a watering down of the definition, an expanding of the term to make it a big tent sort of affair. Let's continue the history of evangelicalism now really throughout the 20th century. Why? Because if you're an evangelical, you need to know from whence you came so that you can know where you are and where this movement that you consider your moniker is going. And then the neo-orthodox followed suit. Karl Barth called his magnum opus evangelical theology. The historic evangelicals, the paleo-evangelicals, were more or less driven out of mainline denominations in the first half of the 20th century in order to preserve the purity of their evangelical fellowships. And one of the great lessons we ought to have learned in the course of the 20th century is about the vitality of evangelical conviction. The gospel is indeed the power of God unto salvation, and churches can't stay alive long without it. Because although evangelicals lost their influence in virtually all the mainline denominations, the fact is evangelical churches grew and multiplied anyway, so that despite the current mess evangelicals have made of their movement, in the broad sweep of the 20th century, evangelicalism was more successful by any measure than all of the liberal denominations combined. And that should have strengthened our our confidence in evangelical principles, but instead, in my assessment, historic evangelicalism today has become an endangered species. If this fellow who still doesn't dye his hair, how annoying is that, is correct, you, if you are a paleo, a classic evangelical, as we defined earlier, you are a dying breed. Why? Because in the early 20th century, the rot began from within evangelicals that were willing to accept a broader definition of the classical term, allowing others to squeeze in. And the movement, it did indeed grow. Was it healthy growth? Well, some was indeed, because there were a lot of paleo evangelicals, but increasingly, the defectors from Protestant Christianity in the early 20th century were finding a home in evangelical Christianity, but at the same time, more liberalism was being introduced. What a shock. The slippery slope theory, frankly, is alive and well in my estimation, and so it began in the early 20th century, starting in the mid-19th century, a decline from paleo principles of evangelicalism into the bowl of pottage that we know as evangelicalism today. How exactly did we get here? An evangelicalism that has literally turned into a circus, and that just isn't some sort of metaphor. Literally, churches turn their worship services into circuses. How did we get here? Next on Wretched. Poverty, lack of education, unambitious lifestyle, alcoholism, just a few words to describe a Roma village, but something is happening there. The Tomorrow Club's bringing the gospel to the Roma people. $30 a month, you'll be discipling 30 Roma children. Would you please consider supporting your own Tomorrow Club at tomorrowclubs.org slash wretched, tomorrowclubs.org slash wretched. You are not stuck with your health insurance program that doesn't meet your family's needs or costs too much. There is a biblical alternative, MediShare, affordable biblical health sharing. 
Customer satisfaction rates through the roof, big savings per month for your family, and a massive doctor network. You are not stuck. Call 844-34-BIBLE, 844-34-BIBLE. Welcome back to Wretched. Do not thank me for what you're about to see. Instead, thank the man behind the camera you're currently looking through. Sebastian asked during the break, seriously, are there really like churches that have circuses? Oh, silly rabbit. No siree, Bob. It's the 21st century evangelical church. We don't settle for mere circuses. No, we have Cirque du Soleil Church. There's only two types of people out there Ones that can hang with me And ones that are scared Oh baby, I hope that you came prepared I run a tight ship, so beware I'm like the ringleader, I call the shots Remember, the resurrection of Jesus Christ it's far more interesting when you present a dystopian nightmare on your stage. That raises a question. How did we get here as evangelicals to help us answer that question? Phil Johnson. Evangelicals didn't learn from their own history, unfortunately. And in recent years, they have sold their birthright for a mess of cultural pottage. So let me summarize by saying, I think there were two disastrous turning points in the 20th century that sealed the doom of the evangelical movement. Either one of these events would have done serious and potentially fatal damage to the movement, but together they virtually guaranteed that the movement would become what it is today, a pig's breakfast filled with false teachings and tired religious cliches that frankly have no authentic historic evangelical connection whatsoever. History is always a little dicey to study because it's so big, it's so broad, there are so many events. Nevertheless, let us endeavor to take a look at the 20th century to figure out how did we ever get to Cirque du Soleil Easter Sunday? The first unfortunate turning point was a parting of ways between evangelicals and fundamentalists. And it wasn't an abrupt rift that you could easily put your finger on and put a date to. The division actually began, I suppose, when the original fundamentalists defined themselves. And instead of two principles that embodied both the formal and material principles of the Protestant Reformation, the fundamentalists published a long series of up to 100 tracts, which they later combined into 12 hefty volumes defending the essential doctrines of Christianity. And, and the brunt of their defense originally was aimed at higher critics, modernists, theological liberals. And I personally wouldn't quibble with any of the doctrines that they deemed fundamental. They were all important, vital doctrines. But I think they lost focus on these two pillars that were the most important. For example, they gave short shrift to the doctrine of justification by faith. And in those large volumes of collected tracts on fundamentalism, there's only one article that is completely devoted to the doctrine of justification by faith. If my memory serves me right, it was written by Handley Moole, and it wasn't one of the more energetic essays in the collection. And I, I see that and the subsequent drift of fundamentalism as evidence that the fundamentalists were already, in the early part of the 20th century, beginning to lose sight of the biblical hierarchy of what's truly essential and, and how supremely important are these foundational truths of gospel principles. Let's recap, shall we? 1850s London, Charles Spurgeon warning his fellow evangelicals, careful, uh, the definition of our house. Can a house have a definition? It's getting watered down. In the meantime, in the U.S. of A, neo-orthodoxy was being introduced to Protestant Christianity, making those circles increasingly liberal, driving out people who were evangelical, even if they wouldn't have called themselves that, to the movement we know as 
paleo-evangelicalism, classic evangelicalism. In the meantime, our fundamentalist brothers and sisters, and you are my brother and sister, I love fundamentalist Christians. We have some distinctions on tertiary issues, but in the beginning of the 20th century, evangelicals and fundamentalists, they started to increasingly grow apart until the middle of the 20th century when it went and from the early 1920s on, fundamentalist energies were increasingly being invested in things other than fundamental doctrine. Things like prohibition and intramural squabbles over personalities and politics, speculations about the end times and, and a laundry list of even more trivial things became the focus of too many fundamentalists. And by the 1960s, the fundamentalist movement was so obsessed with issues like dress codes and rules of conduct, and, and later then it became Bible versions and music styles, and the fundamentalist movement lost its grip on the, the one most important evangelical essential. And it wasn't that they overtly denied sola fide, or they didn't really attack the doctrine of justification by faith, but as a movement, they frankly didn't give it much stress or attention. Please note again, fundamentalist Christians are indeed Christians. Their focus, however, increasingly was obscured from robust theology to being more engaged in some cultural issues, not to war against the world, but to separate from the world. And that brings us to the 1950s and the birth of not paleo-evangelicalism, but modern-day evangelicalism. That means if you're a fundamentalist and you're a little bit annoyed at this critique, don't worry, it's the evangelicals' turn next on Wretched. When a woman is alone and believes her only option for her unplanned pregnancy is abortion, she needs Preborn Ministries. When a woman visits a preborn center, she receives a free ultrasound which saves a baby's life 80% of the time. Right now, Preborn has a matching grant. That means every $28 ultrasound you provide will become two ultrasounds. Visit preborn.org slash wretched. Russian Orthodox churches dot the landscape of Russia, but the Master's Academy International is changing that. What I like about TMI is its focus on quality rather than quantity. We are working with a small group of people, but we're hoping that the Lord will use that small group of people in the coming decades to impact the Church of Christ in Russia. Let's change the landscape of Russia. Please sponsor your own seminary with the Master's Academy International. Welcome back to Wretched, taking a stroll down a memory lane to understand how evangelicals have arrived at the state we are currently in. If and you recall, we are in the 1950s. Fundamentalists, our brothers and sisters, increasingly concerned with the behavior of the world and a desire to separate from the world, focusing less on theology and more on morality, evangelicals started to think, hey, wait a second, we need to be affecting the world more. And that is when modern-day evangelicalism was born. Great men who desired to reach the world with the gospel and affect it, even to a degree, socially. And so it was, we saw a division, tragically, between fundamentalists and evangelicals in the 50s as it continued to grow apart into the 70s. And by the 1970s, the rift between the two groups was clearly irreparable, but the numerical growth on both sides of that divide obscured the gravity of the problem. In 1972, fundamentalism boasted nine of the 10 largest churches in America. And also in 1972, evangelicals held a massive open-air event in Dallas, Explo 72, modeled after Woodstock, 
And the Jesus movement was at its peak, and both movements, evangelicalism and fundamentalism, seemed to be growing and thriving. But evangelicalism was already flirting with the pragmatism of seeker sensitivity, and pragmatism drove out most of the remaining doctrinal convictions that evangelicals hadn't already compromised, and the result was a pathologically superficial brand of religiosity that dominates the evangelical movement today. Meanwhile, fundamentalist separatism got so far out of hand that by the the late 1970s, fundamentalists were battling one another. And today, the remnants of the erstwhile fundamentalist movements are so fragmented, and some of those communities are so bizarre today that defining or describing fundamentalism is no less challenging than trying to explain what evangelicalism is. So that biblically biblically committed, biblically sound, old-style fundamentalists are sadly an endangered species. Tragic indeed, but at the moment we are not focusing on our fundamentalist brothers and sisters. We are studying what it is that caused evangelicalism to go drifting away. Then the second thing that spelled the doom of the evangelical movement in America was the rise of so-called neo-evangelicalism. This was a movement that was strongly influenced by the, by the drift of Fuller Seminary. And it was led by men who were affiliated with Christianity Today and the National Association of Evangelicals, and driven mainly, I think, by a desire for academic respectability, even at the expense of a clear and consistent testimony. It was Harold John Ockengay that named the movement. He was an extremely influential voice in the mid-20th century evangelical movement. He helped found Fuller Seminary and Gordon Conwell and the National Associations of Evangelicals. He was pastor for many years of the Park Street Church in Boston, and he's the one who proposed the idea of evangelical, neo-evangelicalism and gave it that name in a 1948 meeting of the, at the Pasadena Civic Opera. Uh, Civic Auditorium right next door to uh, Fuller Seminary. 1948, neo-evangelicalism introduced with a desire for academic credibility to a movement that was already turning its focus more toward changing the culture. Fast forward to uh, law and law today. Evangelical Christianity has increasingly become dominated by individuals who would like to perhaps water down the Bible so that the world will be more attracted to the church. The seeker-sensitive movement took that concept, polished it up, turned it into a stage production, almost removing evangelical Christianity from a high view of the Bible, and just like the fundamentalists focusing less on theology, not to become separate from society, but to become a part of the culture and apparently change it? You hardly hear anyone today but fundamentalists talk about neo-evangelicalism or the danger that it posed, but the fact is that neo-evangelicalism completely overwhelmed and commandeered the entire evangelical movement, and the influence of that movement, the neo-evangelicals, is, I think, the primary reason the movement itself is no longer truly evangelical. In short, the evangelical movement imploded because it nurtured its own deficiencies. Neo-evangelical principles ultimately eradicated every trace of historic evangelicalism, and those of us who are paleo-evangelicals, frankly, now don't have any well-defined movement that we really belong to. Does that perhaps help you feel a little better about being adrift? Perhaps you have had the uh, table conversation about whether or not you should continue identifying yourself as an evangelical. Obviously, that's your call, but if you adhere to grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, revealed in the Bible alone, and you desire to see the world know the good news of the gospel, whether you like it or not, you are 
an evangelical. What is the moral to this whole story? Surprise, next on Wretched. Bailiff, please have the witness put the right hand on the Bible and administer the oath. Oh, the Bible, which actually says, our yea should be yea and our nay should be nay. Does the defense have any more witnesses? Yeah, two of them <laughs> in Revelation 11. Hermeneutics curriculum. Oh, you could learn how to evangelize in Sunday school. Oh, how's about a curriculum on marriage? All of these resources and more available at the Wretched Store. If you're looking for curriculum, or a lot of them, which would be curricula for your Sunday school, and you'd like it to be biblical and robust and exceedingly practical, would encourage you, check out our offerings at the Wretched Store. And if you would be so kind, also check out our new resource, Drive-By Biblical Counseling, to introduce you to biblical counseling. I'm telling you, you're going to love, love, love the resources at the Wretched Store, wretched.org slash nothing. Welcome back to a wretched surprise, trying to learn from history so that you and I can know how to engage in our world as evangelicals today. As we learn from Phil Johnson, giving us a brief tour of evangelical history from the 1850s to today, neo-evangelicalism has really commandeered paleoclassic evangelicalism, bringing in the seeker-sensitive movement and watering down evangelicalism today to the point where it's almost unrecognizable. If Charles Spurgeon were alive today, he'd walk into so many churches that are focusing on putting on a show, entertaining people with life lessons rather than thrilling them with robust theology about the Lord Jesus Christ. He wouldn't even know that this was his movement. What do we do with that? Clearly, it's up to you whether you choose to identify as an evangelical or not. Your call, but might I simply suggest this? Rather than being consternated, frustrated even, and perhaps spending a lot of time wrangling with people who call themselves evangelicals, rather than trying to rescue the movement, if you will, how's about focusing on ourselves and our local church. As we saw in this brief history, liberalism continues to pull. If we are not yanking to the right, you will drift to the left. And you can choose to engage with watered down evangelicals to debate who's a real evangelical or not, but how's about defending our own hearts, focusing on the truths of evangelical Christianity and putting up the walls, not from the world, but from liberalism around our own churches so that they do not go drift, drift, drifting away. And until tomorrow, go serve your king. Congratulations to David Parkinson. You're the winner of today's free download, Christian Liberty. And you could win free stuff too. All you have to do is sign up for the free Wretched newsletter at wretched.org. Wretched, amazing grace.